We are thrilled to welcome one of the foremost minds in the fields of computer science, privacy and artificial intelligence, Professor Arvind Narayanan. He is a professor of computer science at Princeton University and the director of the Center for Information Technology Policy. His work was among the first to show how machine learning reflects cultural stereotypes and his doctoral research showed the fundamental limits of de-identification. Narayanan was one of Times inaugural list of 100 most influential people in AI. He's a recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. So let's hear him in conversation with HT's Vishal Mathur. Hello to all our viewers to this year's Hindustan Times Leadership Summit. It's special because this year your loved Hindustan Times is 100 years strong. And it's also special because we are joined by a very special guest, Professor Arvind Narayanan from the Princeton University. Well, he really needs little introduction because he is the definitive voice about the personal technology, a lot of the technology that we interface with on a daily basis, and of course, the inevitable questions that come with it. Artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, ethics in AI, the way technology tracks us on the internet. Those are just some examples. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. If I may begin. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Uh, in your new book, uh, AI Snake Oil, you've referenced very nicely your fears about the availability of AI to consumers as a major societal problem. What would you tell consumers out there in terms of how they should be using the tools that are already available to them and save themselves from the inevitable pitfalls that come eventually. AI has many benefits. It also has risks. AI being widely available to consumers is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, uh, for the first time now in the last few years, it is the case that anyone can access really, really powerful AI systems that previously may have been only available to companies and governments. So we think that's largely a good thing, but of course we can only realize the positives if we're very, very aware of the risks. We know what the risks are, broadly speaking. We have things like uh, students using AI to cheat and therefore not getting as much benefit out of education as they otherwise might. We have people using AI to create non-consensual nude images of people. This is, of course, affecting hundreds of thousands of primarily women uh, in every country in the world. So there are many of these types of misuses that are possible. Now, for some of these types of misuses, I think it's the individual's responsibility primarily uh, although companies should certainly improve their products. So when we're talking about misuses like, for instance, lawyers who are using AI to try to get help in making uh, their legal arguments and they don't realize that these chatbots can quote unquote hallucinate, they can generate wrong information, and uh, you know there have been many stories of lawyers getting into trouble with judges. I think that's a matter of people needing to be better informed about the limitations of these systems. And the companies developing them need to make more clear what the limitations are. On the other hand, when we look at other risks, like uh, the things we were talking about, the creation of deep fakes, for instance, those should be addressed by regulation. It's not a matter of saying everybody should use these tools responsibly. There will always be bad actors and we need regulation to address those. And finally, in the book, we distinguish between generative AI, which is what I've been talking about so far, and predictive AI, which is used to make consequential decisions about people when we apply for a job, when we apply for a loan, or even in the criminal justice system in many countries. And this is a very dubious kind of AI. It's being used to predict who will commit a crime, who will pay back a loan. These are things that are hard to predict. And so uh, these uh, AI systems are being used in very unjust ways. And I think as a society, we should be really careful about them. We need more regulation. We need companies to think more carefully about how they're using these systems. Inherently, with something like generative AI, which needs data sets to learn what it eventually learns, is it really possible for it to 
perhaps avoid problems like bias or hallucinations? In the last couple of years, there has been a lot of progress made on the problem of bias. So for instance, one kind of bias is that if generative AI is primarily trained on uh, text and images from the Western world, it might not be very good at, for instance, speaking in Indian languages or correctly visually representing uh, the culture in many countries of the world. This has been a problem for a long time. Things are actually improving. There are ways to incorporate more diverse data sets in the training of these systems. There are ways after they have been trained to kind of fine tune their behavior so that they're uh, better aware of cultural differences, nuances, progress is happening on these fronts. It's not going to be perfect. The hallucination problem, I think, has been harder to solve. But I think more and more we are seeing chatbots that don't necessarily answer questions from their memory, so to speak, but retrieve information from the web and try to summarize that information. That cuts down the rate of hallucinations. It doesn't completely solve the problem. So I think for the time being, users of generative AI have to be aware that this is an inherent limitation. I don't know on what time frame it's going to be solved, if ever. So it's going to be our responsibility to be more careful. You mentioned the example of lawyers getting into trouble with judges. There have been numerous examples of students getting into trouble in schools by using uh, generative AI tools to answer their uh, assignments. Why do you think humans are not really stepping in when they could easily identify that the generative AI tool is giving them wrong information? Why are humans being incapable of correcting technology, if we may. I think maybe I'm a little more optimistic than that. I think we do see many people using these tools in a responsible way. But when someone makes a mistake, of course, that's more likely to make the news if there is a funny story of a lawyer who has submitted a brief in court that is full of incorrect citations, made up cases, and so forth. So we hear about that a lot more, I think, than the millions of people who are using generative AI in beneficial ways and are aware of the limitations. But that said, you know, with any new technology, there is going to be a learning curve. We are still learning to use the internet and social media in a more responsible way that has taken several decades. And I think for generative AI as well, the learning curve is going to be slow. And we see these new technical systems coming out on a time scale that is perhaps too fast for people to adapt to. And if that accelerates further, I think that's going to be a real problem. And we need to think about digital literacy in a different way. And learning how to better make use of digital systems has to be a bigger part of how we spend our time online. It can't be just a passive matter of taking the path of least resistance that is going to become more and more problematic. I must ask you, Professor Arvind, uh, is it really possible to regulate AI? And what's your take on how regulation around the world seems to be panning out? I do think it's possible to regulate AI. And to think about that, we should remember that AI is not just one thing. There are many kinds of AI. We have talked about generative AI and predictive AI. There's also the AI that generates our social media feeds, for instance, and has been blamed for many kinds of problems like increasing polarization, enabling people to use social media to sort of fan the flames of sectarian violence because these uh, AI systems sometimes amplify the most uh, divisive posts that are being shared online. Uh, there is the AI behind self-driving cars, for instance. So there are many kinds of AI. And when we think about all of these separately and we, we think about regulation separately, I think that becomes a much more tractable problem than just asking, how can we do AI regulation? So when we look at self-driving cars, as just as one example, that's already very heavily regulated right? in many parts of the world. AI used in banking is very heavily regulated because it's not even specific to AI, simply because banking is heavily regulated. High frequency trading is heavily regulated. And so I think the best way to think about AI regulation is not to focus on the AI part, but instead to focus on what are the harms we're concerned about and to have regulation that mitigates the risk of those harms, whether or not AI is being used. And that is the style of AI regulation that I'm most optimistic about. There's been a lot of conversation recently about artificial general intelligence, which is 
pretty much the definition says it's going to be smarter than the AI that we already use. Do you think AGI as a technology is ready for the real world and are we as humans are ready to accept it amongst us? Uh, I think AGI is many, many years away, possibly decades away. It's hard to predict exactly what the timeline will be, but we have thought deeply about where AI technology is now and what is required to reach AGI, which to me, I think of it as something like an AI system that's capable of automating most of the tasks that people do in the economy today. And of course, if AGI were built, it would be uh, completely transformative for society and for uh, every country's economy. However, there are just very serious limitations in today's AI systems for which we don't really have good ideas on how to overcome them. It's going to require scientific breakthroughs. It's going to require multiple scientific breakthroughs. Here is just one simple example. When we talk about the generative AI systems behind chatbots, you know, they are trained from text on the web, and then there is a little bit of a post-training step. But after that, when they're chatting with users, there is no learning going on. And this is something that people often have misconceptions about. So it is true that AI companies want our data and they are trying to train AI systems using that data, but that learning is not happening in an ongoing, flexible way in the way that any person, even a child, can learn as we interact with the world around us. So that's a big, big difference between current AI and human intelligence. It's kind of static. It happens during this massive training process that goes on in data centers, as opposed to in everyday conversations. So that means that the flexibility of AI today is very limited. Uh, I can list a bunch of other limitations, but we need new technical ideas to overcome these limitations before we get anywhere close to AGI or artificial general intelligence. In a broader perspective, is it worrying that we are so willing to cede control to technology? I think we should be very careful. I think at every stage, we should ask what is the right amount of control that we want to uh, seed, if you will, to technology. And when we look at the past, we have had to make those careful decisions in every domain. So in aviation, for instance, right, we have autopilot. Autopilot is a very successful technology, but it's only very successful because, A, we have acknowledged that in normal situations, autopilot can largely do better than uh, human pilots. But we also know that in some exceptional situations, autopilot doesn't have the kind of common sense, flexible thinking that is required to recover from difficult situations that might be encountered uh, during flight. And so we've had to develop rules for when it's okay to use autopilot and when the human pilots need to take back control. So we need to go through that kind of exercise in every single domain in which we are putting AI into operation. And if we don't, then we are risking potentially catastrophic failures. At this point, I would like to inform our viewers that Professor Arvind has been closely tracking what tracks us on the internet, the World Wide Web as we know it. In a paper a few years ago, you wrote about the long tail of tracking. So how much of a soup do we find ourselves in now with, as consumers, with what's being, uh, what, how much we're allowing ourselves to be tracked on the internet? And is there really any escape from this now? So this is happening primarily because of the online advertising industry. When we use apps on our phone, when we browse websites on our computers, we might think that we're interacting with a particular app or with a particular website, but hidden behind that app or website are sometimes dozens of other companies that are essentially making notes of everything that we do online. And this is being used to tailor ads to us and for various other commercial purposes. Uh, yes, the state of affairs is pretty bad. So we've also looked at, in some other research, we've looked at smart TVs, for instance. So TVs are now essentially becoming just like computers or phones. And so everything we might do on these smart TVs is also being tracked. And then that is being linked to what we do on our uh, mobile phones and other uh, personal devices. Uh, however, I think in the last few years, there have actually been some improvements, both improvements in terms of regulation and improvements uh, in terms of technology. So for instance, browsers now have uh, anti-tracking features. Uh, Apple, for instance, has an ability to opt out 
uh, allow consumers to opt out of app tracking. Uh, and I do think we should make use of uh, these features. If we take a few minutes to change our uh, privacy settings, we can make a big difference to the amount, uh, the extent to which we're tracked online. You know, every app that we use has a privacy setting screen. And um, I like to, you know, maybe just take a few minutes a week when I'm using using my apps to go in there and see if all the settings are uh, what I'm comfortable with. So I think we do have a lot of control over the situation and we should take advantage of that. In fact, you mentioned the uh, measures that Apple has implemented recently. And from my personal experience, I can kind of verify that a lot of social media platforms now don't have that recent information that probably Safari has cordoned off very nicely. They're still relying on much older information that they have for targeted ads. Uh, but in, in your what what's your take in terms of all the claims that big tech companies are making that fine we are fighting uh, against users being tracked online is it enough and what else do they need to do i think the actions by companies are not going to be enough so we're seeing an interesting silicon valley versus silicon valley dynamic when a company uh, like apple for instance as the device maker uh, they want to track our activities as much as possible, but they will try to prevent websites or apps uh, from tracking us through Safari or through the iOS app tracking transparency feature. And so this is an interesting uh, contradiction, if you will, but you can understand what is going on. I think there is both a competitive aspect to Apple's behavior and to the behavior of other companies. Uh, they want to do as much tracking by themselves. They don't want other companies to track as much. But also, I, I do think it does genuinely improve privacy. That's certainly not going to be enough. We need, you know, we need to keep the pressure up on companies as individuals. We can take a lot of steps, and I think we should also keep pushing for regulation on this. You spoke about regulation. Uh, what sort of regulations would actually be able to counter what we're currently facing? So let's talk about maybe privacy regulation as well as AI regulation a little bit. So one style of regulation is to give individuals more control. I think this is you know somewhat uh, valuable so for instance in the european union the gdpr does many things the general uh, data protection regulation but one of those is to um, incentivize uh, companies allow users to opt out of cookies and in fact there's eu regulation even before the gdpr that had that effect uh, so you can see both the advantages and the limitations of that a lot of consumers you know perceive it as an annoyance more than a helpful thing that you have all these cookie pop-ups all the time so um, putting control in the hands of individuals is not the end of the story uh, i think regulations like the gdpr also have other aspects, more systemic aspects, where they require companies to do certain uh, data protection assessments before uh, putting technologies into action. So that's a different style of regulation. Uh, and maybe a third style of regulation is uh, uh, just to set some minimum standards for, for companies and to say, you know, this, this is the floor. So this this type of data should not be collected at all, maybe biometric data, right? So that is a very high risk kind of data. And so that's not a matter of consumers opting out. No company should be able to allow, uh, should be able to do this. So those are various different kinds of regulation. I think we are seeing a mix of those all around the world. Uh, and when it comes to um, AI regulation as, as well as privacy regulation, I think a lot of what is required is just better enforcement. A lot of the time, companies might make promises like, oh, our AI is not discriminatory or our uh, products are privacy protecting. But then uh, when you actually look at what's happening, that's not true. So that's simply you know, a false claim that the company has made in the market. So I think regulators can enforce truth in advertising law. So that is uh, a way to help the situation that doesn't even necessarily require new regulation. And thank you so much, Professor Arvind, for joining us. Thank you. This has been a great conversation. Mm -hmm.